Hi, hello, 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 everybody. I am so excited to be up here. We are concluding day two of NetRoots Nation, and we have seen so many excellent panels and trainings, and last night's keynote was amazing. It was just a cavalcade of luminaries in the progressive world. This has all been really fantastic. I'm excited to, well, I can't really see you, but I'm imagining you, and I'm, I'm hoping you're smiling. I'm imagining us all in our homes. It's a little creepy, maybe, but whatever. We're all friends here. We're all friends here. There are thousands of us across the country, actually more people, uh, I think, I don't know, so don't quote me on this. I think there's more people this year than we had last year, and last year, again, thousands, tens of thousands of people watching, so this has been fantastic. I want to thank all of you out there because, good Lord, for the last year and a half, we have been adapting and adapting and adapting, uh, and that, of course, includes this conference, and so for you all to come back. And for everyone to come back in even larger numbers really means something special to me. You make this conference possible. I also want to shout out to some of the organizations uh, and firms out there who have really been pitching in, digging extra deep to make this conference just a little bit more accessible um, for all of us. So let me start right from the top, thinking our biggest sponsors, our premier sponsors. We have too many to name, but these are the ones um, that, that really dug deep for us. They include 350.org, Act TV, which you're watching right now, Act Blue, Aspiration, Clarify Agency, Demand Justice, YouTube, Facebook, Daily Coast, I Am an Immigrant, an Informed Immigrant. And there are so many more out there um, that have uh, sponsored in one way or another and made this conference possible. So I just wanted to start right off the top with gratitude to each of you out there and to the firms and organizations that make this possible. I also can't believe that we're here. I have been waiting so long to come back together with all of you. And even if it's online, this last couple of days have been absolutely amazing. Being able to access so many different conversations, learn from so many different people. It's really been extraordinary. Just yesterday, I learned about more about the electoral landscape. I popped in to learn more about the state of reproductive justice in this country. Um, I got to learn a little bit more about the climate crisis and how to talk to your neighbors about COVID. So many different things. I even got to do a little training about how to use your voice and then got to um, get into one of those video chat rooms, which is a great feature. I encourage you to use that too. All of this is, again, possible because we've all been able to come together like this. As a sort of movement, we have fought so hard. We fought hard to put the president in the White House. We fought hard for Congress and for the Senate. We fought hard for state legislative and state executive wins as well. And we've been doing that at this conference or convening at this conference for more than 15 years. So it's been an extraordinary journey. One thing I will say though, is that we haven't really talked, I think adequately, not yet anyway, about the third branch that we sometimes leave out. Listen, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I, uh, I kind of revered the Supreme Court in a, in a kind of weird way. I was like, oh, this is such a cool institution, the way that the founders wrote this institution into the constitution. I actually did a whole term paper on it. I thought I was a pretty smart kid as an undergrad. And I talked about, I did this little research and thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my thing on the, on the Supreme Court and how it's been above the fray. Well. Even just a little bit of research tells you that's not the case, not even a little bit. So the paper ended up being about the politicization of the Supreme Court, which, you know, right out of college, I became an organizer. I've been doing that for 20 years. And like I said, for 20 years, we've been organizing in the electoral world, in the issue world. We've been doing all this work, but the work that doesn't get attention as much is the work that we do around our courts. The system itself doesn't get enough attention for the need for its reform. And so today, for this keynote, that is what we will be dedicating this keynote to. And again, just like yesterday, we have some great luminaries and some deep conversations. Um, and I am so pleased to be able to present all of that to you. I should say, first, my name is Arshad Hassan. I'm a longtime board member at, uh, here for NetRoots Nation, and I run the firm Convey Communications, helping people really lift and raise their voices up. And all of this, again, is possible because of all the work that you do. So we're going to start today 
um, with a message from a absolutely iconic member of Congress, uh, Representative Barbara Lee. Let's roll that tape. I'm Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and I represent California's beautiful 13th Congressional District, which includes Oakland and Berkeley, California. Yes, we are truly in a pivotal time in the fight for a progressive future. From abortion rights, to climate action, to raising wages and dismantling systemic racism, so many of our priorities are intersecting, and it's time for us to act. With the Democratic House, Senate, and White House, we're poised to make generational investments in addressing these issues and move toward a more progressive future. However, it is so important that we remain honest about the challenges that lie ahead. The horrors of January 6th and the spread of the big lie showed us that we must work hard to keep our democracy intact. A functioning democracy is not a given rather something we must continue to strengthen and fortify with common sense policy reforms that empower our communities, especially marginalized communities, to be involved in our democracy. That means key reforms to voting rights, voter access, and the reforms to the court. We have much work to do, but this is a movement. We have the tools, we just need the political willpower to deliver. Next, you'll join from my colleagues in Congress in a conversation around the fight for court reforms and the urgent need to strengthen our democracy. Thank you so much for the work that you all do. Let's keep up the fight. Oh man, thank you, Representative Barbara Lee. Um, next, we have a really deep dive and I want to introduce the moderator for our big panel um, that we have coming up today. Um, I think you're gonna really be fascinated by this conversation. It's gonna be pretty uh, amazing. Our moderator for coming up, who'll do the rest of the introductions, her name is Sarah lipton Lubit, and she's the executive director of Take Back the Court. Like I said, this is gonna be a deep dive into the Supreme Court. For the better part of the last two decades, Sarah has been an advocate for reproductive freedom, gender equity, and progressive change overall. Most recently, she served as the Vice President for Reproductive Health um, and Rights at the National Partnership for Women and Families. Sarah, welcome to Netroots Nation. What have you got for us? Well, thank you so much, Arshad, and, and thank you to the entire Netroots Nation community and Mary and her team for all of the tremendous work uh, that went into putting together this event. Uh, and of course, thank you to Congresswoman Lee, who is just never short of inspiring. Uh, and I'm just, I, I can't believe I get to follow, uh, follow her into this conversation. So I am so grateful uh, to have the chance to be here today and talk with all of you about these issues. Uh, and, and why are they so important? Because without expanding the court, everything, like literally everything that we're all fighting for is at risk. Uh, what, why is that? So in the last four months alone, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court has gutted the Voting Rights Act, effectively ended Roe v. Wade in Texas, blocked the pandemic eviction moratorium, forced the administration to reinstitute Donald Trump's cruel remain in Mexico policy, curtailed existing rights of workers, discriminated against LGBTQ families, ruled in favor of a Koch front group, trying to introduce dark money into our politics. The stakes just could not be higher. Uh, and that is why I am beyond thrilled to be joined by two incredible champions, Congressman Mondaire Jones and Senator Tina Smith. Congressman Jones is serving his first term uh, as the Congressman from New York's 17th District. And he's really been leading the fight for Supreme Court expansion since before he was elected uh, as one of the first candidates uh, to make it an issue during his campaign. He is the youngest member of the Democratic House leadership team and also uh, serves in the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the LGBTQ Equality Caucus. Uh, Senator Tina Smith, I'm sure it needs no introduction. She's a fierce advocate and serves as the US Senator from the state of Minnesota. She has had more than 50 bills and provisions signed into law, helping make healthcare more affordable and accessible, uh, benefiting working families, farmers, tribal communities, Prior to coming to the Senate, uh, Senator Smith served as Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor, uh, and critically, I think for this conversation as a Planned Parenthood executive. Uh, and they are both uh, just exactly the kind of champions that we need now 
more than ever. And I'm really excited to dig into this conversation with both of them. So Congressman Jones, let's start with you. Uh, you recently wrote a piece about the court's systematic dismantling of voting rights that begins before the politics of white grievance wore a red hat, it wore a black robe. And I take from that, well, one, you're an excellent writer, but two, that the, these issues with the Supreme Court are something that you've really seen brewing for a long time. Can, can you talk to us about how you came to conclude that we have to expand the Supreme Court? Uh, well, Sarah, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, and it's such an honor to be alongside someone I've admired for a very long time. Uh, and of course, that person is my fellow Stanford alum as the senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. Uh, it, it is clear as day to the American people who increasingly are in support of court expansion uh, that this is no longer the same Supreme Court that decided Brown v. Board of Education or Roe v. Wade, for that matter, as we've learned in recent weeks. Uh, it is the case that we have a 6-3 far-right hyper-partisan supermajority on the Supreme Court, and it is a majority that is hostile to democracy itself. Uh, what really got me going is the court's systematic dismantling of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, that crown jewel of the civil rights movement that when it was passed, became the first time in our nation's history that we truly had a multiracial democracy. And it is through case after case, beginning in Shelby, the holder in 2013, which struck down preclearance, uh, unleashing, uh, you know, or, or allowing the ability of states like Georgia to enact the laws that they've enacted, uh, that we've seen new era of racist voter suppression. Uh, and of course, even before Shelby, there was that 2010 case called Citizens United, which unleashed unlimited corporate spending in our elections. And I believe that we are seeing the repercussions of that today as policies that e are enormously popular across the political spectrum are in peril of not being included in this Build Back Better Act, uh, among other things. Uh, because of the, the chokehold, really, that corporations have over some politicians through this, their outsized influence in our politics. Uh, so this is, this is an existential question. This is about whether we will continue to have a democracy as the people who don't want to certify presidential elections after nearly dying alongside me hours earlier at the Capitol on January 6th are poised to regain control of Congress if we don't use this rare opportunity to actually govern and to undo the voter suppression that we have seen and to shore up existing systems through same day and automatic voter registration and into partisan gerrymandering and so many other things. Uh, but of course, restoring the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 through passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Thank you. Um, there's so there's just so so much at stake um, for our democracy that we really need to, to dig into and, and talk more about today. Senator Smith, you spoke out about court expansion in the wake of the court's decisions and the Texas SB8 case, uh, a law banning abortion at six weeks of pregnancy before many people even know that they're pregnant. And to say that that was a sobering moment, it clearly is an understatement uh, that the court would just enable Texas like that in the dead of night in a one paragraph opinion on the shadow docket, no oral argument. I mean, I could go on and on. Can you talk about what that decision in the Texas case meant to you? Uh, and in light of that, how you think about issues of court reform? Well, yes. And first, Sarah, it's great to be with you and great to be with all of Netroots Nation. And uh, Mondaire Jones, it's good to share the screen with you today. It's wonderful to be, uh, be a part of this conversation. So, you know, Sarah, when that court case came down, that shadow docket decision, as you say, in the dead of night, effectively denying uh, the people of Texas their right to an abortion, 
that ability to control their own reproductive lives. I mean, I was stunned, but I wasn't surprised. How could you be surprised? Because what happened with that shadow DACA decision was the culmination of what has been 50 years of an organized, highly funded effort to capture the courts of the United States of America led by the Supreme Court. And what you saw in that decision, that Texas decision, was a court that was willing to throw out 50 years of precedent um, to pursue what, in my mind, is a clearly a political goal. And when that happened, I was just, I, I said to myself, you know, how could you not, you, you can no longer not deal with the reality of what's happened here. I think a lot of us have this sort of hopeful idea that in the midst of all of this polarization and all of the great, the, the great challenges to our democracy, that the Supreme Court still stands as the branch of our government that is above politics, that is what it was supposed to be, what it was designed to be, which is a neutral arbiter of the facts and the law. But it, at our great peril, do we ignore the reality of what has happened to the courts because of that 50-year effort by far-right um, extremists, the um, Federalist Society, and this campaign to take over our courts? And so for me, at that moment, the question is, okay, like you can smile and look the other way. You can figure out what you're going to do about it. And clearly the need for reform is shouting out to us. One of the most important reforms that we can make that we have within our control is to add members to the United States Supreme Court to get it to 13 members, which would restore balance to the court um, and allow the court um, to more effectively do what it's supposed to do. Um, which is to interpret the law and not make the law. So that was a clear and obvious step to me as I thought about it. And, you know, I thought about it in the context of my years of being an activist and an organizer, um, especially my years working at Planned Parenthood as a volunteer and then um, as, a, as a leader of Planned Parenthood working for them. And I saw what this means to women who get so fundamentally that if they don't control, if we don't control our reproductive lives, we don't control anything about our lives. And that the Supreme Court could just take that away um, so dramatically and so quickly was, uh, was a call to action. I think not only for me, but for many, many people. And honestly, I think it's gonna be a call to action um, as we go forward um, into the next election as well. No, I, I think that's exactly right. There's this um, fiction, this narrative, uh, this hope, I think, uh, mm -hmm. that so, so many of us who have kind of grown up, come of age after Brown and after Roe and uh, celebrating Obergefell and, you know, especially among folks um, on the left, folks in the center, there's this desire to, to hold the court out, like you said, as, a, as an arbiter, a neutral arbiter of our rights. Uh, and I think it has uh, blinded us um, to, to what's really going on and, and, and the story un, unfold that's been unfolding in front of our, uh, in front of our eyes. Um, but as you said, this, this moment, the court's actions you know, in the Texas case, in the voting rights case, mm -hmm. in some of these other decisions that we've seen uh, have been a real activating moment for, for so many people uh, to, to see what's truly going on. And, and I think we've seen, you know, in recent polling that public confidence in the court is it's really in free fall, uh, particularly among Democrats uh, and independents. Uh, and I, I know some of the folks who've noticed that are the justices themselves, right, who've been going on these speaking tours, really lamenting the fact um, that there's this public perception that they're nothing more than politicians in robes or uh, I think partisan hacks, right, uh, as, as some like to say. Um, and, you know, coming on the heels of all of these decisions, that, that certainly rings hollow to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it doesn't help doesn't help that they're giving these speeches uh, literally standing uh, next to Mitch McConnell, uh, talking about how nonpartisan they are. But, you know, the justice is talking about wanting the public to trust them more. I don't think that's going to work. I hope it doesn't work. It shouldn't work. 
Um, you know, I'd love to hear what each of you, you know, think is necessary in order to restore the court's legitimacy, uh, in order to, to make the court worthy of that trust. Uh, Congressman Jones, do you want to share your thoughts? We, we must expand the court in order to accomplish that. Uh, it is simply the case, based on the evidence before us, uh, a, a systematic dismantling, again, of the Voting Rights Act and, and overturning of, of generations of precedent, despite the fact that in that specific example, Congress unanimously reauthorized the Voting Rights Act in the, in the Senate in 2006 and nearly unanimously reauthorized in the House. When does that ever happen? Uh, this, this Supreme Court majority uh, has, has sort of leapt out of its seats to, to, to strike down laws that protect the right to vote, especially when it concerns uh, people of color in this country and lower income individuals. Um, it, it has not seen a voter suppression law that it has found to be unconstitutional. Uh, now it is, in addition to quietly overturning Roe v. Wade, because if it doesn't exist in some parts of this country, then it doesn't exist at all. Uh, I want to be clear about that. Uh, it is it is moving to explicitly overturn Roe v. Wade in a case that it is granted review to, in addition to an expansion of its terrible decision in D.C. v. Heller, which made us all unsafe. Uh, you know, it's taken up a case that would expand uh, with respect to that uh, to that case of uh, the, the right of people to own firearms in this country, uh, making it an unfettered right, I think. And so we are in grave danger. It is no exaggeration to say, because of the partisanship on the court, the Roberts Court, to be precise. Uh, and I don't think that moral persuasion or uh, even the best education that you can get in this country, which all of the justices have, uh, is sufficient to get them to do the right thing. I think what is required uh, in the face of these brazen power grabs by the conservative majority on the court is to do what we have done seven times in our nation's history, which is adjust the size of the court to restore balance. You know, most Americans don't believe in a 6-3 anything. And so uh, there, there's, I think that's part of why there's just so much support, a groundswell of support among the American people for this idea of, of rebalancing the court, restoring balance by adding four seats. Uh, and I think Unfortunately, no other proposal that I have heard, including from well-intentioned people, would stop the crises that are currently endangering us, uh, the crises of rights being stripped away that we had just taken for granted when it comes to reproductive freedoms and the fundamental right to vote. Uh, it's why I'm so proud to be championing this bill, this bill along with the senator. We really are. We really are in crisis. Uh, Senator Smith, did you want to build on that at all? Well, um, I really appreciate what um, Representative Jones is saying. And I am thinking as he, you know, as, I, as I'm listening to him speak, I'm thinking about how we got here with, remember how we got here exactly, specifically to this moment, is we had Mitch McConnell hold open um, a vacant seat on the United States Supreme Court for about a year. Um, when it's basically stealing a, a Supreme Court nomination from President Obama. Um, and then we have the disaster of Justice Kavanaugh. And then uh, forcing through the confirmation of Justice Coney Barrett um, in the literally days before Vice President Biden was elected to be President Biden. So we can see the clear intention of this, of, of the, the political intention of stacking the court with these far right justices. And, you know, what should be happening, these justices are, you know, declaring that they're, they have differences of principle and not of, um, not of party or, or, or political affiliation. But if that were the case, then personnel on the court would not trump following the law and precedent. And yet that is what we see so explicitly with this Texas case. Though as Mondera is saying, it's not only the Texas case, it's these other cases. So again, we come back to this point, seeing the reality, are we gonna just say, well, that's the reality or are we gonna take the, you know, use our voices and use our power 
to make the change and the reforms that we need. Adding justices to the court is an extremely important step, and I'm very glad to be joining Representative Jones here. I also want to say that I think there are other things, other kinds of reforms that it makes a lot of sense to look at. Um, for example, many people don't really realize that the United States Supreme Court does not have any judicial code of ethics. They have no requirement to disclose who pays their speaking fees or who pays their airplane trips. They don't have to disclose any conflicts that might exist between their, um, you know, it, between the, the, the cases that they're deciding and their own personal finances. This is, I think, a huge gap, a huge need for reform. Um, and just another example of the kind of thing that we that we could look at to make the court be more responsive, be more accountable um, and be more transparent. And I just say, I, I'm just so glad to have both of you in this fight uh, because there's the, the need is so tremendous uh, and and your leadership is so, um, so necessary and, and so spot on and clear eyed. Uh, and to, to everyone watching right now, I just uh, wanted to encourage you, if you're attending the conference and watching through Socio, please uh, please drop your questions uh, in the, the comment feature and, and we'll do our best uh, to take them later on in this conversation. So, you know, it, it's like we have these two, um, two poles of, of what's happening right now. As, as both of you just described, uh, we have a court that is issuing just these radical precedent unbound decisions. We have a supermajority uh, of justices who got there in a blatantly partisan, illegitimate way. Um, and at the same time, you know, if we look back at, at this last term uh, that just finished up, uh, you know, and we've, we've just started a new term this week. But if, if we look back at last term, you know, we saw all of these articles from all of these pundits uh, talking about how the court is somehow uh, moderate, right, uh, based on decisions about, you know, mundane aspects of law where, where the various justices uh, can agree. Uh, and, you know, of course, most of those, uh, most of those articles were before the cases at the end of the term gutting the Voting Rights Act, gutting labor protections, uh, facilitating dark money, and then all of the, the shadow docket decisions that came over the summer uh, that we've just been discussing. So you, you would think that the curtain has been pulled back, right? That people understand what's going on, uh, understand uh, what the court is up to, whose interests they're serving, just how radical they are. And yet, I think none of us would be surprised if we start to see some of those same headlines again this term, even in a term with such uh, such important cases as both of you have just shared. Uh, there are, you know, a lot of vested interest in holding up the institution of the court in trying to quell our concerns uh, and dampen the me momentum for reform that Congressman Jones was just talking about, which is building and building and building, and. You know, how can we help people understand what's really at stake in these cases when the court tries so hard to hide behind technicalities, right? And, and here I'm thinking about, you know, how they tried to excuse the Texas opinion as merely uh, procedural uh, or the hand wringing over whether the decision in the upcoming Mississippi abortion case will include the words, we overturn Roe which you know, on one level is incredibly important and on another level is irrelevant because the question that really matters is after that decision, what will people's access to abortion care look like? Uh, and that is so, so much more salient to people's lives and to what the court is doing than however the court decides to label its own actions. Um, so in light of all that, how do we help people understand both what's at stake and what the court is actually doing when it can be so inaccessible? And how do we make sure that public concern and, and anger, rightful anger, righteous anger uh, over the court's behavior doesn't fade before we're able to fix the problem, expand the court, institute some basic ethics code, um, all of the things that, that we need to do to get our democracy back on track? 
Senator Smith? Well, I think that what is going to happen here is that, uh, I mean, uh, if as we suspect, and honestly, as we have been warning and fearing for years, if the court substantially rose, rolls back uh, women's uh, reproductive rights and reproductive justice this term, uh, I believe that it's going to be a galvanizing moment and it will help people to understand uh, what impact the United States Supreme Court has on their daily lives. You know, the court can seem like sort of, as you just said, Sarah, kind of a of an abstract and far removed entity that doesn't have any real impact on our daily lives. Um, yet the reality is far different. And the impact of these decisions, I think, is going to start to be felt uh, by Americans in, in, in ways that maybe it hasn't been before. I sometimes think just on the question of abortion rights that, um, I mean, abortion rights, um, uh, being anti-abortion rights has been a organizing and a mobilizing call for the far right for a long, long time. And uh, they are about to, I think, be the dog that caught the bus on this issue, uh, because we know that on that issue of uh, re reproductive choice, that that is broadly popular with the American public. And yet, I believe we're on the verge of the Supreme Court overturning that right. Um, I think that that's the case. I'd love to hear what Mondaire thinks about this. I think that that's going to be the case on issue after issue after issue with the Supreme Court as they take radical steps that are dramatically out of step with the American public. And I believe that that will help to dramatize how, um, how disconnected this court is, how politicized it has been, and will help to inspire the kind of organizing action that we have to take. And as a group, as we all are today on this, uh, on this call of being organizers, we know a good organizing issue when we see it. We know how that can become a way of building relationship and building uh, connection and community to get the kind of change that we need. And uh, that's, what we have to, that's what we have to grab onto. I, I, I agree. Um, you know, it, it pains me to say what I've said before, which is that, and, and what the senator has said, which is that I think it's going to take this Supreme Court majority continuing to roll back rights that we had just taken for granted in our daily lives in order to get sufficient support in Congress to pass court expansion. But what we are doing right now is we are laying the groundwork, and that is an important task. Uh, we've got increasingly national organizations signing on to the Judiciary Act of 2021. Uh, we are having entire panels on this subject, uh, broadcast to, to hundreds if not thousands of people. Uh, we've got the American people on our side when you look at the polling. You know, when Data for Progress did a poll, uh, the day after the Judiciary Act was introduced on Thursday, April 15th, it showed that 75% of Democrats supported adding four seats to the court and that a plurality of likely voters, specifically 47%, supported adding four seats to the court. I think a firm called Navigator did a poll last month showing 91% of Democrats and 61% of independents support court expansion. Uh, and, and, so, and so the ground is fertile to make this argument uh, that it is the most important thing, the most important step we could take if we want to neutralize this, this activism that we have seen within the, among the Supreme Court majority uh, by restoring balance. Uh, and it's no secret that some of the biggest skeptics, including within the Democratic Party, are people who are part of the legal establishment, Sarah, to, to you know, related to some, some points that you were making earlier, folks who really want to believe that this is a Supreme Court that they studied in law school uh, a decade or so ago. And I get it. I went to law school and I have at times been very grateful for the Supreme Court. But on balance, this is a court that is hostile to our democracy and to our fundamental rights. It is not the Supreme Court even that existed a decade ago. Uh, and, and that court was terrible enough in terms of dismantling the heart of the, the Voting Rights Act and, and, and its Citizens United decision. And that court even was already chipping away at Roe v. Wade 
if we are to be honest. Uh, and, and so it, it is this, what we are seeing is the fulfillment of a, of a project that has spanned generations on the conservative side. Uh, and, and we, unfortunately, on the Democratic side, on the progressive side, on the liberal side, whatever you want to call it, have not taken the courts as seriously uh, as our friends on the other side of the aisle have. Uh, and we are now paying the price, uh, but we are not powerless to stop it. And that's why we, we must continue to make the case uh, at, at, on panels like this uh, and continue to prevail upon uh, people with influence in our society and continue to to tell the organizations that we are part of that they should take a hard look at Supreme Court reform before it's too late. Well, and Mondair, I think what you're saying really reminds me of something that we all know, which is that, I mean, almost all the time in our history, change comes from the bottom up. It comes from the grassroots. It rarely comes from the top. It comes from folks on the ground that are, that are feeling what's happening and speak out about it. And I believe that that is why that Roots Nation is so powerful and why this conversation is so important. A lot of times people who have the power tend to uh, think that they tend to overestimate the risks of action and underestimate the risks of inaction, right? Like, I, you know, if I'm not exactly sure, I'm just going to sit tight. And in that sitting tight, things get worse and worse and worse. And I think that's the situation that we're in with the courts. So I think a lot of people are going to be hearing this message. And um, even people in power um, are going to say, maybe the risks of inaction are just too great right now. Well, the risks of inaction are too great right now. So let me just, I will repeat it a uh, hundred times and, and from the rooftops. Because um, as, as we've you know all been talking about this evening or th this afternoon, depending on uh, where we all are, um, you know, in, in decision after decision, that's coming down, you, you know, not just over this this last um, short period of time with the supermajority, uh, but for decades of a right wing makeover of our entire federal judiciary, um, real real tangible harm is being introduced to people's lives, um, and I think you know I think you're 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 both exactly right that. As that continues to happen, more and, and more awareness will be raised, more people will be activated. And at the same time, you know, the, the need to, to intervene, the need for action is now before more people are hurt, right? We don't, we don't want to wait for that, um, for those moments, uh, for those moments of harm before, before we really take action here. Uh, and, you know, in, in this, uh, community of, of organizers uh, and, and activists uh, that, that we're all in and, and speaking with tonight, you know, I'd love to hear more um, from you about what, what you think folks can, can be doing to make a difference. You know, a year ago uh, when Republicans were, were racing to conform, uh, confirm rather Justice Barrett uh, after voting in the 2020 election had already begun. Uh, a number of Democrats said, well, if they do that, uh, and if Democrats win control of Congress, court expansion has to be on the table. Uh, since then, both of those things have come to pass. Uh, and some of those members have now confirmed their support for expansion. Others haven't. Uh, and, and many other members who understand the threat the court poses to our rights, our health, our economic well-being, and, and who understand the illegitimacy of the supermajority and how folks were put there have not yet vocally embraced expansion. Uh, so, you know, I'm curious, these are your colleagues. What do you think is holding them back? Uh, and importantly, what can people outside of Congress, pe people like all of us, um, be doing to help build support for court expansion inside of Congress? Uh, me to go, <laughs> oh, no, go ahead, please, Andrew Smith, you want to go ahead? <laughs> well, a part of this gets to what I was just saying. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, part of this gets to what I was saying about the kind of overestimating the risks of taking action. And what I hear a lot of times from my colleagues is this sort of what I guess I would just call like bluntly the fear of retribution. 
you know, if we do this, then they'll do that. And then it becomes a spiral that is going to be bad. And what I say back is um, they already did that. (laughs) They already did the thing that we should be afraid of. They already politicized the courts. They already stole two Supreme Court justices. The question is, what are we going to do? What responsibility are we going to take? What actions are we going to take to restore balance? And um, I think that that is really, really important. The second thing I'll say is that we have to organize and win elections. And that is, uh, uh, it seems like such a simple thing, but it is kind of the only thing um, in the world that we live in right now, at a, particularly at a time when our democracy um, is, I think we are in touch with how democracy is not a given. It is the thing that we have to fight for, um, especially right now after this last uh, tumultuous year. So, um, yeah. And, and, and that's why everyone on this call has such a big, is, has such powerful voices if they use them to help people to start to see that this is, uh, this is what we have to do. Yeah, you know, a significant number of, of the approximately 40 co-sponsors that we now have in the House uh, got on the Judiciary Act because groups met with them mm-hmm. and prevailed upon them in this moment. Uh, of, of, of great anxiety and righteous indignation towards the court uh, to, to be bold. And, and, and you know, and, and really it's not, it's not as bold as a lot of folks uh, who don't want to see it happen try to make it out to be. Not only is it deeply rooted in the American tradition it having been done seven times before, my goodness, McConnell just did it a few years ago, I mean, when you when you leave a Supreme Court vacancy open for 14 months, you change the size of the court. Uh, and then when you rush through Amy Coney Barrett, when an election is underway, you 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 pack the court. Uh, and of course, the lower courts have been packed as well. But that's maybe for another panel. Um, the most common concern I hear uh, is 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 the same that the senator mentioned, and and frankly, it's frustrating because. I mean, come on, we like we see that the crisis is already here. Can it get worse than a 6-3 far right majority that doesn't want to see reproductive freedom continue, that doesn't believe in the fundamental right to vote and is over overturning the rule of Congress? That's really bold. That is bold. When when near unanimous chambers of Congress vote to reauthorize something that has existed since 1965. Uh, you know, so so it's the crisis is already here. And the question is not what if they do it again at some indeterminate time in the future, but what will we as duly elected members of Congress with the power to do something about it do in this moment while people, millions of people increasingly are seeing harm done to them in their daily lives? Uh, by the Supreme Court majority. And, you know, that, that point that, that you each just made, um, Republicans have, have already done this. They've changed the size of the court. They've said, you know, if Hillary Clinton is elected, we'll never appoint another Supreme Court justice again. Uh, Senator McConnell has said recently, He's not interested uh, in allowing the president to uh, fill fill a Supreme Court seat should he have the opportunity to blockade that. Um, So very much this is is already in course. This has already happened. And the question for us is, are we going to do nothing? (laughs) Right? Are we just going to do nothing? Um, And uh, as as you both said so well, that's really just just can't be an option. Um, uh, you know, thinking about the, the audience that we have today and that we're speaking to, uh, and I'll encourage you again to su- submit your questions uh, if you want to ask them. Um, you know, when, when we think about the threat that the Supreme Court poses to the progressive movement, um, to the progressive uh, agenda, to all our priorities, it's really coming from multiple directions. So scores of laws are being passed right now, uh, anti-abortion laws, as we've been talking about, 
voter suppression laws, as we've been talking about, precisely because people think that the ultra conservative supermajority will uphold them, right? And, and all signs point to, yes, they will do that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and folks need to be clear eyed about that. And at the same time, We've also seen the conservative justices be unwilling to merely assess the cases before them uh, and instead have chosen to invite cases, right, to ask for cases Mm -hmm. that are going to help them advance their agenda and their goals. Justice Alito has uh, famously done this in an effort to undo various labor protections. Chief Justice Roberts has a very long uh, and not good history uh, with voting rights. Um, uh, and an agenda that he's been pursuing. Uh, And we know that there are folks out there ready to run to the most conservative district court judge they can find the moment that any kind of progressive legislation is passed out of Congress. Uh, And and so from both directions, really, the, the entire progressive project is at risk with this current court. Uh, climate legislation, healthcare legislation, labor protections, abortion rights, right? Any kind of positive, uh, positive work uh, that we can do that, that, that you and your colleagues can put out there all run the risk of being dismantled or gutted uh, by a court that is intent uh, on acting in, in, in service uh, of this right-wing agenda, which, which is how they've already treated voting rights. And so given that, and I I know I think we've spoken a little bit uh, to this already today, but given all of that, how should we be thinking about the relationship between court expansion and the progressive movement overall? I I would posit uh, it's it's really hand in glove with the entire project, everything uh, that folks are are trying to work on and, and trying to pursue um, curious, uh, curious mm-hmm. to, to hear what, what you all think about that, Senator Smith. Well, I think that's clearly the case, Sarah. You're absolutely right. And in fact, on the, on the far right side, that is what uh, their big money operation and Federalist Society and big corporate money operation figured out 45 or 50 years ago, which is that the path to achieving their policy goals was to capture the court. And we have to understand the implications of that um, and then be ready to take action to address it as we think about what our agenda is to restore American democracy. You know, we have such a moment right now today with the president's Build Back Better budget and the work that we're doing in Congress to pass transformational legislation that will make childcare more affordable, that will finally address the crisis of Uh, of climate change that will restore the decades of damage done to uh, uh, the rights of people to come together collectively and organize for better working conditions and better benefits and and, um, better wages. That agenda sits there and it it sits there with the real risk that this far-right conservative court is going to undo it before we even get it going. And so it is a a direct um, threat to the work that we have to do to move our country forward towards a better, more just, um, you know, t- future for, for everybody. Uh, and I think that that, I mean, that for me is so galvanizing as I think about the work that, that, uh, representative, um, that, that representative Jones and I are doing right now to try to make real progress for people. You know, if you think that we could get the PRO Act upheld in an environment where this Supreme Court majority has already been hostile to labor uh, or Medicare for all, when this is a court that has been chipping away at Obamacare uh, or, or even betting that once we pass in the Senate, the Women's Health Protection Act that this court won't potentially find ways to make exceptions to it or maybe even strike it down altogether, uh, then I think that people are not thinking clearly enough about how activist the Supreme Court majority has become. And it's painful to say because we wanna believe that we'll have 
a Supreme Court that is respectful of the will of Congress, that most important branch of government described in Article I of the Constitution. But that is not where we are today. That is not how Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett and Neil Gorsuch and Sam Alito and so many others feel. And so we have to be very clear eyed about the fact that, as you mentioned, Sarah, the entire progressive project is in peril so long as these conservative justices comprise a majority on the Supreme Court of the United States. So in light of that, we have a, we have a, a question from the audience from Ruby, and I, I think this is uh, exactly spot on to, to what you both were just talking about. She asks, how can we get democratic leaders more onto a strong fighting mode uh, instead of trying to work like it was 10 or 20 years ago? Why, why are some Democrats concerned with trying to appease people that will never support or work with them uh, instead of pushing, uh, pushing for the policies uh, that, that we know that we need? E elect more progressives to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Uh, you know, we bring a sense of urgency around these issues with us. We are unafraid to be bold in, in, our, in our prescriptions for the most intractable problems that our nation and that the globe face. Uh, and, and it's not something that's unpopular. These, these policies are deeply popular, including court expansion, are deeply popular with the American people. Um, and we also candidly need more national groups to get behind this. Um, I've, I've been a little frustrated by some of the conversations I've had, and, we, and we've seen some progress on the filibuster in recent days with certain national mm -hmm. groups. I'm so grateful for that leadership. Uh, but a lot of members of Congress still look to see uh, whether certain national groups have endorsed something before, before going out on a limb as they consider it, uh, when in reality what ends up happening is that the American people tend to be uh, farther along than certain members of Congress who are playing catch up all the times. Yep, I completely agree with that. And, you know, as you're speaking, Mondaire, I'm thinking about being, you know, coming from the state of Minnesota, uh, I consider myself to be a pragmatic progressive. You know, I wanna figure out how to accomplish things for people. And I believe that we have to always be focused on, on the people that don't have a voice at the big table where the decisions are made. And too often the folks sitting around that big table just don't are out of touch, honestly. They don't really understand what's happening in the lives of, of their constituents. And you know, Minnesota is a um, you know, the proud home of, of uh, you know, Hubert Humphrey and Paul Wellstone, um, but it's also the home of Jesse Ventura. <laughs> I mean, it is a state that is that is dynamic in its politics. But what I have learned from representing this state that I think goes directly to Ruby's question is that um, people just don't really want you. They want you to not don't be afraid of your own shadow. Don't be afraid of speaking out. Use don't be afraid of using the power that we have to accomplish things for for people. That is why we are here. And uh, I think if we did more of that, and if you got out there, I mean, I can go to the most rural parts of my state and I will find the most progressive voices. People who are, this is not, I don't believe always an urban versus a rural issue, or it, it is about just whether or not you have the, you're, you're, you know, you have the guts to stand up for what you know is right. And we do need more uh, members like that. And, um, and, and we also need to appreciate that every, you know, I, every state is different. Not everybody is going to be representing Minnesota or the district that um, Mondaire represents. But in that big milieu of progressive politics, there is so much space for us to be able to get important things done. So um, I've seen it here in my state, and that is what I try to do every single day. And we need, you know, we just, we need to be, we need to be stronger. I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to, to make a plug then, which is, I know, uh, I know a lot of folks watching work for progressive organizations, work with them, work near them. Uh, and so, you know, my, my, uh, my ask to you is, uh, if you're working in an organization, 
that hasn't uh, hasn't come out in support of port expansion yet, that hasn't you know had had the conversations that it needs to have about port expansion uh, and um, how salient it is to the entire progressive agenda and entire progressive movement. Um, please, please have those conversations. Um, you just heard how important it is uh, to be able to support um, leaders in Congress who are trying to have these conversations with their colleagues um, for you all to, to come out in, in support of these issues. You know, in the last few years, this movement that we're all building, this, this amazing movement for court reform uh, has grown from probably zero uh, to now 90 groups uh, in support of court expansion. So B91, B92, B100, right? That's how we build this movement uh, and, and that's how we get this done. Um, and you, you don't have to take my word for it. But listen, listen to the Senator, listen to the Congressman. Um, you know, we, we need that, that kind of uh, mobilization. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're coming up on time, and, but I just, you know, as we are thinking about these, these big questions of democracy uh, and, and government, and as we're thinking about, about all of that today and, and over the course of this conference, um, I, I, I wanna close with this question. Uh, slash observation. I'll, I'll take the privilege. Um, you know, Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the eight last presidential elections, uh, but they've controlled a majority on the Supreme Court for more than 50 years. Uh, so, you know, defenders of, of the status quo of the court, you know, people who tell us we, it doesn't matter that Congress has changed the size of the court seven times before or eight, uh, if you count Republican intransigence, um, you know, we, we, we need to leave the court alone because it's supposed to be a check on the tyranny of the majority. Um, but it, it, instead, I think it really has uh, become something different and, and something worse, right? Which is like a tyranny of the minority. Uh, and, and we see that in Congress as well. Uh, and that really, you know, threatens the very legitimacy uh, of our government, which is based on, on the consent of the governed, right? That, that's what our entire structure, our entire democracy is about. Uh, and so, it, you know, in closing, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the role that court reform plays in making all of government more responsive to the American people. Senator Smith. Well, um, first, let me just say thank you so much, Sarah, for that. That is spot on. And um, as I listen to what you're saying, I'm thinking about how we, we need systemic reform in our country of the courts. We also need reforms in the United States Senate so that a minority of senators who represent less than 45% of the American people can control the agenda of the United States Senate through the filibuster. Uh, Institutional reform at all levels, I believe, is absolutely vital for our democracy to continue to function and to continue to truly represent uh, the American people. And that is so true of what we need to see with the United States um, Supreme Court. Uh, and these ideas, you know, I believe, because I'm a progressive, that good ideas build over time as more and more people um, work and push and make their voices heard. And even as you just said, this, the, this move towards expanding the court has become so much more accepted than it was even just a year or so ago. So for that, I'm very grateful and we have to keep working. Congressman Jones, would you, would you like a last word? Sure, uh, though it's, it's hard to go after my friend. Um, Look, this is personal for me. Uh, I remember where I was when the court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. I remember where I was when the court found our Constitution to protect marriage equality. Um, and I'm just, I'm part of a group of people in this country who waits every June to see whether the Supreme Court will take away my rights as an openly gay person or recognize rights to exist that should have been recognized a long time ago. 
Uh, and as with so many other issues that are coming before the court this term and in terms to come, lives and livelihoods are at stake. And it is no answer to allow fear to paralyze us. And, and, and on the theory that um, at some point, maybe they'll do it in response because we have a crisis that is before us. It is a crisis that among other descriptions can be described accurately as tyranny of the minority. And we are running out of time. It is rare that you see Democrats with unified control of the United States government. We must act in this moment. Uh, and, and that is what is at stake. And, and we haven't even talked about climate, but we do face an existential threat with respect to climate change that the Supreme Court is, is hostile to climate regulations and laws as well. So it's so important to be with you and the work that you're doing is, is transformative work. Well, I, I can't think of a both a, a more sobering and an inspirational call to action to end on. Uh, thank you so much to my co-panelists. Thank you for your leadership, for your engagement, for your thought partnership, uh, not, not just for your time tonight, uh, but it's, it's so uh, incredible to have that kind of partnership in this movement. Uh, thank you to everyone at Netroots uh, for all of the work uh, that went into this, for the, the recognition that, that this is an issue um, that needs to be talked about in prime time. Uh, and thank you to everyone for, for taking the time to join us. Uh, appreciate you all so much and good night.